conversation there. Uh, we're very, very pleased to welcome back Cindy Wagman from the Good Partnership uh, presenting again for us today. Uh, many of you will also know Cindy as the wonderful host of our weekly podcast, The Small Nonprofit. But before I turn things over to Cindy, I also just wanted to say that we're really excited to be co-presenting today's webinar with Keela. And we have Melissa Bilko from Keela joining us today. Melissa, um, I'd love to invite you to uh, share a few words. Awesome. Thank you so much, Marina. Yeah, I just wanted to say that we are super happy to be co-presenting this webinar alongside of both of you. Um, I am Mel and I'm the head of community engagement at Kila. And for those of you who don't know what we do, um, Kila is a Canadian company located in Vancouver, BC, and we are a cloud-based nonprofit specific CRM platform that provides intelligent tools, you know, to help guide your decision making and help you work more efficiently with your team even if that's from home. Um, I'd like, if you'd like to learn more, um, you can always head to keela.co slash charity village. Um, we're actually giving away two months free right now um, with everything that's been going on. So anyways, thank you so much and I'll pass it off to you, Marina. Wonderful, thank you so much, Mel. Um, and with that, Cindy, I think we can um, dive right into the presentation. Welcome back, Cindy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me again. Uh, we're so happy to be partnering with both Charity Village and Kila, uh, two organizations that I think share our mission to support the small nonprofits in our communities, specifically in Canada. So, uh, so happy to be doing this and welcome to all of you. Um, so I'm going to get started here. Uh, and I think there is a chat function. I'm not sure if everyone can do that. So either in the chat or the questions, I am going to ask you to participate. Um, but I want to start by saying thank you. I don't know if you've seen this quote uh, from Fred Rogers. When I was a boy, I would see scary things in the news. My mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. And right now, and usually always, that's you, right? We work in a sector that is built on that principle of helping others. And I just want to start by acknowledging how hard it right now is for all of us. Um, there's a lot of emotions, a lot of uncertainty, and uh, it's scary. And so we're here for you, and you know we're we're in this together. And you're probably thinking, uh, if fundraising was hard before, what do I even do right now? Like, how do we get through this? Uh, in a way that helps our organization stay afloat and survive this crisis and get through. And so um, a lot of this content is universal. Uh, I actually started doing this, this content way before COVID-19 was a thing, but uh, certainly a pandemic. And um, it, it's, it applies even more so today. So thank you so much for your work. It is usually very undervalued and underappreciated. So I always like to start by uh, acknowledging how valuable your work is to all of us. So let's start, just turn off your distractions. And uh, if you focus on being here, you will get the most out of the webinar. I, for one, uh, know how difficult it is right now. Working from home, I have two kids who may or may not pop in <laughs> at any time. Um, and there's just a lot going on. So if you can just take a minute to breathe and focus and um, turn off the distractions so that we are here together. All right. Now, I want to start uh, by just getting to know you. So in the questions or in the chat, just let me know, you know who you are and where you're from. I'm going to play a little, I need to be a little like pumped up right now. So I'm going to play a little background music while we do that. Hold on if I can make this work. Let's see if that, maybe it doesn't work. Ah! No audio. But <laughs> in the meantime, uh, please let me know who you are and where you are coming from, what, what work you do as an organization. All right, you can do that in the chat or in the questions. And that's just froze, so I don't know if you can actually hear me. Can you hear me? 
Hey, Cindy, all going well. Yes. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. For some reason, I'm not seeing answers yet, but. Well, uh, we, we have people from everywhere, Cindy. We've got, uh, okay. I, I'm going to say literally from West Coast to East Coast, <laughs> we're doing well. I don't see anyone from the territories yet, but I'm sure there's one or two folks <laughs> signing on from there too. Amazing. Well, welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining. Um, I know your attention is divided these days, so hopefully we can get you lots of great content. So I can't say for sure why you are here today, but I can make some good guesses. Hold on. I might have to stop my screen share for a second and come back to it because it is frozen. Okay, there we go. Hold on. Sorry about that. Um, now it's good. It's right. funny, Cindy, we were talking earlier about anticipating some difficulties with the, the overwhelming <laughs> yeah. amount of people that are uh, joining virtual meetings these days. Exactly. <laughs> There's definitely some tech glitches. All right. There's a lot of uh, bandwidth. So I want to know why you're here today. And I can make a couple guesses, but what I'm going to ask you to do is uh, in the chat, um, let me know which of these I'll tell you what to what to write if these apply to you. All right. So I want you in the chat to type time. If you feel like no matter what you do, you just can't find the time to fundraise. All right. So type time. All right. And then maybe you tried to fundraise but it never seems to work out or be successful for you. If that sounds like you, type fail in the chat. Who here feels like fundraising is always a chore? Like it's the last thing you wanna be spending your time doing. If that's you, I want you to type chore in the chat. And tell me if this sounds familiar. There are a million reasons why you know that fundraising won't work for your organization. You're too small, no one's ever heard of you, you need to rebrand, your board isn't involved, you don't know anyone who can give money. If all these things are preventing you from your fundraising success, type reasons in the chat, all right? And then how about this one? Every time you try to learn about fundraising, it feels like it's designed for large organizations, not small ones like yours. So if that's you, I want you to type small in the chat. Here's another one I hear a lot. You've done all the webinars, read all the books, you know, showed up for all the free stuff, but nothing seems to motivate you to go from idea to implementation. It's like there's a mental block or brick wall. So if that feels like you, type block in the chat, right? Now, as I said, these are all things that apply no matter what, but obviously in today's new reality, you're probably also here because the world is facing a global pandemic. And now more than ever, your organization is suffering because you probably don't have a strong fundraising program. And there's never a better time to learn how to set that up. So if that's you, you can type COVID in the chat. All right. So all of these frustrations and feelings that you're experiencing, both now and pre-COVID, are symptoms of being a reluctant fundraiser. Most people fundraising for small nonprofits are reluctant fundraisers. They don't want to be fundraising but they need to in order for their organization to survive and thrive. And I've seen that all over the place. You know, people who fall into fundraising or who do it off the side of their desk, or it's just one of the many hats that they wear. And usually what happens, because we're so overwhelmed with all the things, is we go into survival mode. So we either fight or flight. So we fight by trying to do too many things uh, and it gets 
that we get overwhelmed by all the options. And this leads to burnout or feeling like we're spinning our wheels, right? Like just, I just got off another webinar this morning uh, from of small organizations and that's it. Like everyone just feels like it's nonstop. And that is us just trying to figure out, trying to keep up, knowing what, you know, may or may not be on the right path. Or we flight and we just avoid fundraising altogether. And I see that a lot. But the reality is that just keeps us up at night, lying awake, worried about the future of our organizations. That is not how I want you to live. But here's the thing. Instead of looking outwards for solutions like how do I do digital fundraising or learn stewardship or move our events along, online? You know, the work that we really need to be doing is internal. And I'm going to tell you why all of your efforts to become a better fundraiser, if you don't address the internal work first, have been completely misguided. Let me explain. So, would you call yourself a fundraiser let me know in the chat say yes or no you know do you call yourself a fundraiser and unfortunately i can't see all the answers um but actually if you go on in the chat and make sure the two says organizers and panelists i should be able to start seeing some of those answers <laughs> um because i love i love to hear from you but the thing is most reluctant fundraisers don't actually call themselves a fundraiser. We don't see ourselves as not part of our identity. And so we also don't like fundraising. And we, I've heard people say it's icky, it's like begging, like they don't know anyone who can give and the list goes on and on. And so these all represent our beliefs about fundraising. We're not fundraisers, we don't like it you know, all of these other negative feelings that come up for us. And have any of you tried to do something that you don't like? <laughs> or had someone else try to make you do something that you don't like? Um, if you have, you will know that we just don't do it. We are hardwired to avoid the things we believe we don't like. So whether it's exercising or eating well or avoiding sugar or your board member who's trying to fundraise, all of these things um, we're not going to do if we believe deep down that it's not good for us or that it's uncomfortable or we don't like it. Okay, our brains are literally wired this way. There are tons of these little shortcuts our brains make that are biases and they have um, our brains are, are set up basically so that 95% of the things our brain does is um, unconscious. We're not aware of it. And it creates all these shortcuts so it doesn't have to work as hard thinking about all the things. And one of those biases is that we are actively, our brain is actually, we're not aware of this, but we are actively seeking out information that affirms our self-beliefs and actively suppresses information that doesn't support them. Okay, so this is called Congress concurrence bias, which is basically you are always, your brain is always trying to prove yourself right. So how does that happen with fundraising? If my brain believes that I'm not a good fundraiser, that I don't like fundraising, then it is actively working against any fundraising efforts that we have. It will ignore the wins and the successes and the progress, and we'll focus on the failures and all the things that we can do instead of fundraising. All right, so this is really problematic when we start to see how we're showing up as reluctant fundraisers. We are self-sabotaging our success. And these, this sort of bias is called a heuristic, um, there are so many more that are actually involved in our fundraising and how we show up, but um, I can't go through all of them. But if you're really interested in learning more, um, these are things, the, this 
science, zero science, is the foundation for things like behavioral economics, which you might have heard of, or choice architecture, or nudging. Uh, there's lots of research and lots of people who um, have information about heuristics um, and also how you can change your habits through neuroscience. So really cool. I love this area. Um, but uh, we don't have time to cover all of it today. But what all this means is that there are so many people who are tasked with fundraising in our world who are reluctant fundraisers and their minds are not allowing them to be successful. And I've worked with a lot of small nonprofits uh, over the, the last few years, especially. Uh, that's all we do as a good partnership. And from this experience, I've noticed four main fundraising archetypes of reluctant fundraisers. So these are sort of the four most common mindsets that we see that are undermining fundraising success. All right. And so for each of these four archetypes, I've, I'm going to talk about them, but I've also created an alter ego. So this is a new and more productive mindset that will help you retrain your mind and feel good about fundraising. And if we can start to feel good about it and embrace it, we are going to see ourselves show up in a much more meaningful way and actually start to get results. Okay, so I'm gonna dive right in. Are you ready? So now I've, uh, apparently you have to um, type in the questions, not the chat. So in the questions bar, let me know if you are ready. And let's see if I can see those. Give everyone a second. I don't know. <laughs> Not seeing them. All right, ready, I think Cindy. a lot of you. They're ready. Cindy. They're ready. Amazing. They're ready. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so before I get started, most of you have already filled out this quiz, but if you haven't and you want um, some more information about which archetype you are, as well as other resources I send in follow up specific to your archetype, uh, you can visit this, um, this page and take the quiz, all right? So most of you uh, have taken it and pay attention to the whole thing because most of us are a combination of them, all right? So the first archetype is the perfectionist. Chances are you're running a nonprofit or you're working in one because you're good at the work, right? Maybe you're a former frontline worker or programmer who knows and loves the work that you do. You live and breathe it and you have all the right answers most of the time. None of us are perfect, um, but you're confident and you're an expert. But nowhere along the path did you learn how to fundraise and that maybe you're not so good at. And while you might not classify yourself as a perfectionist, you may find yourself saying things like, I just need the right plan, or if you tell me what to do, I can do it. And you legitimately try and learn. You take courses, you go to conferences, you show up on webinars, but you still feel walk away feeling this sort of big unknown, this gap in your knowledge and confidence that is too big to comfortably move forward with. So you don't. You have a hard time sitting in that uncomfortable space of not being great at fundraising. So who here identifies as a perfectionist? Well, let me tell you, I was sitting having coffee with a friend over the summer while we pre social distancing or social distancing and isolation. Uh, and we were talking about yoga and I confess that it really wasn't my thing. I'm not a fan and I just didn't, I don't like yoga. I feel like I have a hard time keeping up with the speed while at the same time trying to do all the poses correctly. So I got frustrated and I basically end up like flailing around and, or just sitting on my mat <laughs> feeling bad about myself. And my friend asked me a really poignant question that I will never forget. He said, can you stick with being bad at something long enough to be good at it? I'm going to repeat that. Can you stick with being bad at something long enough to get good at it? 
we weren't born knowing how to do all the things that we now do really well. We were not born knowing how to walk or drive a car or ride a bike. We need to practice. We need to practice not just, you know, but, but by doing it, right? Like it's not just learning about it, but actually taking the action to learn and get our bodies used to it. So for the perfectionist, your fundraising alter ego is the doer. So instead of waiting for all the answers and learning in your mind, I want you to go out and find them by doing things. Success is defined by your effort and what you learned along the way. Your greatest asset is being able to take one step at a time. You can focus on small successes, celebrating every step forward that you take. You know that fundraising is a skill that anyone can learn. I can tell you that right now, everyone can learn how to be a good fundraiser, but how you learn is by doing. And you now, the doer, are a master of doing. And your secret is that you're the only one who knows that you're not perfect. To those around you, you're still gonna look confident and your actions are going to reaffirm that. So your inclination towards action will result in, will result in growing results. Uh, internally, you'll discover that the more you do, the easier it will become. And in the process, you're rewiring your brain to say that fundraising actually isn't that bad and I'm doing these things and it feels good and we're, our, our, neuro, our neuro pathways are changing so that we are putting up less and less of a fight to do that. So we learn by doing, all of us. We learn by not being perfect. The answers are in trying and discovering and skills are developed through experience. So, I want you all, even if you're not the perfectionist, to identify one thing that you've been meaning to do with fundraising and just write it down. You can write it down for yourself in the questions. Um, and uh, the, your goal is to do that one thing, however imperfectly, within the next week. Okay, so this can be, um, emailing your donors to check in on them. Uh, one of the things I'm really loving right now is something called Bonjuro, B-O-N-O-J, oh my goodness. <laughs> bon, B-O-N, J-O-R-O. Uh, and they let you send little video messages to people through email. Um, but there's Loom, there's you know FaceTime, all these other things. What's one thing that you've been meaning to do? It could also be you know your fundraising plan or um, you know, sending an email update, but I want you to start by taking action. All right, and uh, thanks Charity Village for posting that link. Uh, Bonjour has a free version. They're giving anyone who uh, mentions the Good Partnership 30% off their paid subscriptions. We don't get anything from that, but I think it's a good tool for these days. Um, all right, so your goal is to do that thing in the next week. Can you do it? Let me know. All right, the next archetype is someone who gets chills when the word fundraising is mentioned. It's paralyzing. It feels icky. It's a big no thank you. And this archetype takes fundraising very personally. No way can you ask for money. What if the person says no? What, won't that make things awkward? How do I talk to them again after that? I even had a call with someone this week where they were worried that the donors won't like them as much as they like the last fundraiser in their organization. So I call this archetype the wounded. And fundraising is essentially a non-starter for the wounded. The fear of rejection feels too big to overcome. The thought of a no feels like a personal rejection. What did I do wrong? I'm not good enough. Why don't they think our work is worth it? The wounded, the wound is even deeper if we see that person giving to other organizations. What about, what is it about us? What did we do wrong? So let me know, are you the wounded? 
Fundraising isn't personal. Donors are not giving to us personally. They're connecting with our mission and impact. And fundraising success comes from building a strong vision and getting buy-in for that vision. The wounded, therefore, becomes the visionary. The visionary is a community builder. They bring people together over a shared vision and build meaningful buy-in. They listen to others and turn feedback into connection. They mobilize support so that people are saying yes before they are even asked. The visionary, visionary leadership brings people together. The, the focus is not on asking, but on enabling. It's about sharing a path with everyone contributing what they can. All right. I want to put in uh, a little note about small organizations that often have a lot of donors who are personally connected to someone in the organization, because I see that all the time. And this is true for you as well. In order for your organization to build a stable, long-term source of uh, donations, you need to also understand how you can get those people to support the organization regardless of their personal connection. And that is based on the shared vision. So what can you do to start to be the visionary? I want you to connect with people and not talk about money. It's really that simple. Call up your donors, um, schedule a FaceTime or Skype or Zoom, and get to know them and build a shared vision. Forget about money, at least for a while. 95% of fundraising has nothing to do with asking for money. And I can tell you, when I teach people how to fundraise, I repeat this probably 10 times before it actually sinks into them, that they, that they need to get to know their donors as the foundation to really good fundraising. So um, I want you to reach out to at least one person who has given to your organization in the past and ask them why they give. Right? The best thing you can do to get to know your supporters and build that shared vision is to really understand them and their motivations and what they care about and why they're supporting your, your work. All right. All right, ready for number three? This one I get very passionate about. <laughs> so we think in dichotomies. So we are taught in society to, especially in modern capitalist society, um, to think in us versus them, right? The haves and the have nots, the right versus wrong. You know, everything is structured in these dichotomies. Oftentimes, a lot of our work in the sector is actually actively trying to break down those dichotomies. Um, but so much of our society is built up that way. And so this uh, archetype is the idealist. And for them, fundraising is sort of built around those dichotomies. You have a hard time connecting with or relating to people who you consider wealthy. They aren't one of us. And um, what could you possibly have in common? You know, we often think that, especially if we're in the social justice space, you know, money is bad. It is the root of a lot of our, our society's problems. And so how are we, how do we um, balance that with fundraising? And that also means a lot of people are uncomfortable with the nature of philanthropy in general, right? People who have lots of money being in control of giving it to the important social change work that we're trying to do, the power imbalance is, is deeply problematic and um, we'd be much more comfortable with government funding. But the reality is that governments are unreliable and political issues have the power to affect funding in a profound way. And we've seen that, seen that a lot recently. So you reluctantly turn to fundraising. And because of power imbalance, fundraising always feels like you're selling out a little bit or even a lot. You know you, you need to do it, but the excuse that you don't know anyone who can give comes up again and again. 
how are you supposed to fundraise if you don't know anyone who has a lot of money? And maybe you don't even like anyone who has a lot of money. So instead, you focus on government and foundation grants, knowing that these feel more aligned with you more values. But the decline in funding means that these sources are drying up and are less predictable. That nagging reminder that you need to fundraise to do your important work keeps creeping up again and again, and you can't ignore it anymore. So, are you the idealist? Let me know in the, the chat and questions. So the good news is that fundraising doesn't need to be about compromising your values. In fact, fundraising should be the opposite. The connector, your alter ego, knows that fundraising is about finding people who share a connection to your work. Cause comes before dollars, always. Your job in fundraising is to find the people who care about the work you're doing and inspire them to invest in it. That investment can be large or small, depending on their capacity. You know that power and money are connected, so you make sure to include opportunities for those with less money to still give, making sure they still have the power and ownership of the work that affects them. I work with a lot of organizations who serve populations that are traditionally low income, we're facing multiple barriers, and we're always trying to protect them by not asking for them or not, not asking of them. Um, but the reality is they have every right to support your work as much as anyone else. And if your organization is truly empowering and led by that community, they need to have, that you are accountable often uh, to your donors. And so to have them represented within your donor base makes sure that your organization is accountable to the community you serve. We've learned this with boards. Organizations are adding um, community members from the populations they serve onto their boards. And I very firmly believe that that needs to be reflected in our donor base as well. If you want to chat about that, I'm happy to uh, later. I certainly am very passionate about it. Um, but the reality is as well that there are people who have money who really deeply care about your work. And so I want you to cut through the noise of the haves and the have nots and focus on who wants to enable the change you're working towards. You connect with people beyond wealth. Your focus on shared dreams and plans to create change. So your job is to find that shared passion and commitment. And through that, you'll, you'll find you're more like your donors than you originally thought. So if this sounds like you, I want you to do something similar to the visionary, but I want you to connect with one person who has given to your organization in the past, but specifically someone who's given a low dollar amount. I want you to find your 10 and $20 donors and I want you to get to know them. Understand why they give and what they get out of it. All right, can you do that? So the last archetype is a very common one. And if it's not your dominant one, chances are it's still pretty present for you. It's the acrobat. And we can all picture an acrobat carefully walking a tightrope or contorting themselves into otherworldly positions, death-defying feats of strength and bravery, right? This sounds exactly like running a small nonprofit. It's pretty much everyone I've ever seen. So for many of us, burnout is the status quo. It feels like it's part of the package of working at a small nonprofit. Underpaid, overworked, underappreciated, you barely have time to brush your teeth, let alone manage a fundraising program. And for some reason, we think this, is the, this way of working is okay. It comes with the territory. Our work is too important to ease up and to take a break, but for some reason, we can't imagine a sector built on decent pay. After all, we're not driven by money instead by mission, right? And this is the reality for the acrobat. Fundraising doesn't get done because it feels impossible compared to all the other urgent things that need to get done like yesterday. And those things are never complete. 
right? When one thing is crossed off at the top of your list, another thing pops on at the bottom. So let me know, are you an acrobat? So how do we find balance and harmony in this chaos? Your alter ego, the harmon harmonizer, is the leader who knows how to prioritize, focus, and delegate. They know that change comes from doing things consistently and forgiving yourself when you slip up. In order to find balance, the harmonizer learns how to prioritize and differentiate between urgent and important. They understand that nothing around them will change unless they themselves change. You, they, can't do everything. So you focus on the things which have the greatest impact. And the harmonizer learns habits that lead to productivity. They understand that change happens through consistency. You learn how to delegate some things and stop doing others. You focus on how to work, not just on what you're working on. And you know you can't do everything. So you focus on the most important things, including fundraising, because you know that increased fundraising will help you grow and build an organization that is better resourced. So I can and do dedicate hours of teaching people how to focus and prioritize. That is not what we're covering today. Um, but for today, I do want you to focus on finding one hour a week. That's it. And I want you to block it off in your schedule and use that time to focus on getting something important relating to fundraising done. Even better if you can do five hours, and then you'll start to see massive change. But let's start with an hour. One hour a week, put it in your calendar, and don't let anyone else take that time from you. And here's how you're gonna use that time. First, you're gonna turn off distractions and go somewhere where you can focus undisturbed. I get it, these are crazy times. I have two kids in the house, sometimes it's really hard, but I guarantee you, you can find an hour. If you're like me, my, my kids have been on their tablets all week, uh, two weeks, <laughs> pretty much, um, when we're doing important work. And then I want you to focus on doing one thing only. I don't want you to try work multitask. I just want you to focus on one project and start and finish it before you move on to the next, okay? Can you do that? I promise you, if you start doing that, you're gonna see those important projects that have been sitting at the side of your desk for so long, they are start, gonna start to get done. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about authenticity. Um, from an early age, we're taught to be ourselves. But for some reason, that message falls way short when we're thinking about fundraising. I hear all the time, we think that successful fundraisers are confident, outgoing, extroverted, fake, or salesy. Anything but authentic. But the reality is there's nothing farther from the truth. The best fundraisers are totally authentic and bring their whole selves to the work. There are many challenges we have to deal with when running small nonprofits, but the reality is that we can be our own worst enemy when it comes to fundraising. Our beliefs around fundraising can hold us back and sabotage our efforts. Good fundraisers are not born loving it. I didn't even know it was a career option when I was growing up. I only learned that in university. You know, this isn't, <laughs> this isn't the path you take where you're like, oh, when I grow up, I'm going to be a doctor or veterinarian, right? Everyone has the capacity to learn how to love fundraising, but we have to do the work to get there. And that work starts with understanding our mindset and then knowing how to turn our limiting beliefs into the powerful assets that we have as personified by our alter egos. So each fundraising alter ego represents another powerful version of your authentic self. It leverages your beliefs into a mindset that is more productive. It's not about being someone else. It's about finding your authentic approach that is comfortable and achievable. So again, if you haven't taken the quiz, I recommend you do so. 
um, because they'll send you other resources and podcast episodes relating specifically to your alter ego. So you can find it there and it is in the chat. And I want to offer you a couple other resources as we um, wrap up and go into questions because I think we're about at time. Uh, so the first, we have a webinar coming up. Uh, another free one where I'm gonna show you how to raise more money for your small nonprofit by pulling back the curtain and showing you my secrets that I've used to raise over $8 million for small Canadian nonprofits. Um, it's very different content than what we covered today uh, and really foundational to understanding a strong fundraising approach. So for that, you can go to the URL there, flipside.thegoodpartnership.com slash webinar. All right, and oh, I'm getting, I'm on, I'm on a call, Jess. <laughs> Today's realities, right? So in that webinar, I'm going to show you the secret to finding the right strategy, right fundraising strategy for you now. I'm going to show you the secret to getting to yes without even asking, because I know so many people are afraid of the ask. And I'm going to show you the secret to getting, ooh, to getting more done with less stress ignore that last copy there um, and then the other thing I want to mention is uh, we have a program where we teach a lot of these principles in much more depth plus a lot more uh, called flipside fundraising and because of COVID-19 and the impact it's having on our sector we've actually opened up a scholarship program for it uh, Keila is one of our scholarship partners thanks Mel um, and this is a great opportunity to access, sorry, I don't know if you hear my son's little robot thing in the background. Um, but this is a really great opportunity to apply and get um, really the foundations of fundraising. I have been around this fun the fundraising community for a long time, and what we teach people focuses more on the implementation and less on the foundations and so in order to figure out what's the right fundraising strategy for you or you know how do I, where do I focus my time how do we set up our systems to support this if you're an acrobat systems are really important so all these things are included in Flipside and we want to make it available to as many people as possible right now uh, through our scholarship program so if um, if this sounds like what you've been struggling with, I highly suggest you uh, apply for that scholarship. It's also a really fast application. I don't want to take up more of your time right now. You have so many priorities. Uh, so it will take probably three minutes at most five. All right. So I think that's it. Um, Mel, I can't see any of the questions, so I'm going to have to, you're going to have to <laughs> tell me what people are asking. Yeah, no worries. We'll jump right in. And I just want to um, add to the chat box, uh, there's the resource from Kila as well. So I'm just sending that right now so that folks have a chance to uh, grab that before we wrap up uh, today. Um, okay, Cindy, are you ready to dive into questions? I am. I also realized I just called you Mel and not Marina. <laughs> <laughs> we have so many yes, presenters Maria, on today. I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> it's because I love both of you. You're so awesome. Um, okay, so let's start right at the beginning. Um, we have someone asking about what is the first step to take to planning, then getting into how to do it, and then taking action. So I'm assuming this is someone who is very new to fundraising. Yeah. So the number one thing, any organ, so if you have some donors already, the biggest thing you need to do is, is get to know them. That's what I do anytime I start it. Sorry, I'm going to close my door because I'm hearing my son's little robot. Uh, one sec. He tried to sneak in earlier today. I was on another webinar where he thought it would be really funny to make farting sounds. So <laughs> fun times. All right. So if you're not sure where to start, your donors are actually going to tell you uh, if you ask the right questions. So, you know, meeting with them virtually is fine, uh, but asking them about why they give, you know, what they care about, listening to how they talk about the organization, all those things give you clues to what you should be focusing on. 
um, and understanding them and where they're coming from and what they like, all of that is the most important consideration for a fundraising plan. So that's the first thing. If you don't know how, if you're struggling with, and a lot of people get caught up in, okay, so what donors do I reach out to? And how do I do it? And how do I prioritize? There's no perfect way. I want you to just start by doing. So if, if, if you wanna start with where you're most comfortable, that's completely fine. I've seen organizations pick up friends, like pick up the phone and start with friends that they know who give to the organization. Um, some people start with high level donors. Some people start with low level donors. Think about what gaps you have in your knowledge and start there. So a good fundraising plan for an organization is one that is grounded in the realities of what your organization is today. So your donors, your resources, all of that. Um, and so to do that, you really need to get to know your donors. I cannot emphasize that enough. And it is true regardless of the kind of donor you have. So whether it's individual donors, high level, like major gift donors, plan giving donors, foundation donors, corporate donors, you need to understand why they're at the table to be able to effectively come up with a strategy and plan to build your fundraising around that. I hope that answers your question. That's fantastic, Cindy. Um, and we've had quite a few questions coming in about how to help board members who are reluctant to fundraise. And I would say probably number one is share the session with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely share the session. So in my experience, I don't want to generalize, but in my experience, I feel like a lot of board members are the perfectionist. And so they come and they're really good at their, the, their day jobs, but they're not fundraisers. Um, and I, I feel like I'm going to go off on a rant for one second, which is a lot of uh, people try to recruit fundraisers to their board. And like, if we only have one fundraiser on our board, like all of our problems will be solved. That's not true. Uh, that fundraiser is going to walk pretty quickly if they're the only one responsible for fundraising on your board. So all of your board, if they're a fundraising board, some aren't. I'm not going to get into whether that's good or bad or what have you. Um, but if they're willing to try, uh, my experience is that a lot of them are the perfectionist. And so they're, just, you know, they're really focused on just tell me what to do. But then when it comes to actually doing it, they don't follow through. And it's not for any like bad intentions or anything like that. It's just, again, it's kind of our brains working against us. So what I really like to do is start with little things. Again, it's the small behaviors that we can do to start to open ourselves up to fundraising is not so icky and something that we actually can be good at. So a lot of organizations I know do bankathons where they uh, have board members call and thank donors. It's a really good, feel good activity for them. Um, and it, it's really uh, easy. The other thing is in the days of events, which I do believe will come back, um, assign them to like connect with one person and just introduce themselves and thank them for being there and getting to know them. You can have them do some of the donor outreach, which is just, you know, calling and getting to know your donors um, or just bring, you know, engage. I, I think the biggest thing is, you know, just get them to take small actions that don't feel like there's a lot at stake. The other thing I will say with boards um, is, I think there's this um, hesitation sometimes because they don't know what the next step is or what the follow-up is uh, when they're bringing their community to the table. So the other thing is just to set clear expectations. So if we're asking you to bring someone out to, again, I'm going to say an event because fundraising events are true, but if you're, even if you're asking your board to send a letter, you know, let them know that when they donate online, you know, this is the next step and here's what we do with their contact information and here's how we treat it. And we'll let you know when they donate if we have that capacity, right? So um, that communication I think is also really important. 
No, that's great, Cindy. And um, just for those that are asking, yes, you will get the recording of this session uh, by email. So definitely uh, feel free to share that with your boards uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, we've also had uh, some questions about uh, finding new donors. And I, I'm going to ask you to jump into that in just a second, Cindy. But mm -hmm. um, along with that, we've had folks asking about how to find granting organizations, and especially for the person who asked if there's a yellow pages for <laughs> grant uh, giving foundations. Cool. I'm going to just pop a link in the chat box to the Imagine Canada uh, Grant Connect because they're offering some free services right now as well with everything going on and that will be a great place for you to start. Um, yeah. So Cindy, if you want to speak to that as well as uh, where to go to find new donors. Absolutely. So 100% um, agree Grant Connect is if you were looking to, right now it's three, free for three months which is amazing of Imagine Canada that is in response to uh, the pandemic. So um, definitely start there for grants. I haven't been a big fan of a lot of the uh, other services. Usually we're pretty tool agnostic and I, I, you know, there's lots of things out there, but I will say uh, while we don't usually endorse, I would definitely endorse Grant Connect. That is the one we use most often. Um, so that's great for foundations. Where to find new donors? So the first thing is you have to understand what you're looking for uh, or who you're looking for. So um, that's why I believe that understanding your existing donors is so important because they're going to tell you the more you know them, the more you know about what you're looking for when you're out finding new donors. There's lots of different ways. Um, I believe that your existing donors are the best source of potential new donors. So if you give your donors an opportunity to introduce you to people in a meaningful mission-based way, um, very often they do. My favorite for that are small events, which will come back. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, there are ways that you can actually, like during this uh, pandemic, you can uh, do some list building stuff where you're offering Understanding what your donors are needing right now from you. Um, how do you deliver that in a meaningful way online? And then um, just have them access it in exchange for an email address. So we do that with almost everything we give away free. We give away a lot for free, but all I'm asking for is an email address. And that's how we build our community and our list. And I try to make sure that all those things that we give away have a lot of inherent value to our community. And I would highly suggest that you do the same right now, um, especially if you are, uh, you know, struggling with do I fund? I mean, still fundraise right now. Still tweak your plans and adjust, but I don't want you to stop. But in the meantime, figure out how you can serve those people and provide them with things of value. And how do you get to share that online and through? Uh, you know, if you're sending something out that your donors will value, that they would value enough that they would share with other people, you know, that's a really great, great opportunity. There's so many other ways to find new donors, um, you know, volunteer groups, so uh, setting up a fundraising committee, um, corporate donors, a lot still happen through connection. Um, but also, as I said uh, earlier in the webinar, don't discount the community you serve, especially right now. If you're doing work that is so important to them, um, they're going to want to see you survive and they will surprise you with their generosity. It might not be a lot of money, but if you have a really strong um, community that you serve, regardless of their financial capacity, I think that there is some uh, potential to engage them uh, through giving. All right, hopefully that's that Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, and then I wanna finish off today uh, with just discussing obviously the elephant in the room, the COVID situation. I know there's no playbook here. Everyone is doing the best they can uh, as we go along. But do you have any um, thoughts uh, around that and, and how fundraisers can, can keep going right now? Uh, yeah. Oh, I want to quote my friend Jen Love because she made a really great, she has a really great tweet that I think sums it up beautifully. But like now is the time for us to show up in a really authentic and heart-centered way. And so 
that's going to mean a little something a little bit different to your organization but you know understanding that the world is not ending and if your organization was important before it's going to continue to be important and so i don't want you to stop fundraising uh, i do want you to adjust most of all where organizations fell flat before is around that authenticity piece that really like human to human connection and that is where we really need to shine right now. And I really believe that we need to approach it from a place of, of service, right? So how, what are we filling, what gap are we filling for our donors? Why are they supporting us in the first place? And how does that look now? So hopping on the phone, connecting with people, um, just in a really meaningful and authentic way. One of the good things about small organizations um, is that uh, we don't have huge data donor bases so we can actually meaningfully connect with people um, and start with that and again there's no right answer that's going to be universal for everyone the more you stick to what's authentic and meaningful to your organization as well as authentic and meaningful to your donors that will guide you on the right path of what to do um, it's hard because people love very specific concrete answers. Um, so I'll give you a couple examples. We have we work with an arts-based organization that does programming with children and youth. Uh, they're not running programs right now, but we're in the process of piloting some online uh, art program for companies to do to build their corporate culture while everyone is working online. All right, like totally out of the box. I'm excited about it. Um, but that's based on their supporters are more corporations. A lot of them have been giving around employee engagement. So how do we deliver that in a new way? Um, it, so yeah, it really, it really depends, but, uh, everyone needs to just keep fundraising. Um, because if you don't, you will seriously jeopardize the longevity of your organization. You might not be as successful as in the past, um, but you don't want things to dry up and disappear completely. Mm -hmm. And your donors care about you and your work. They want to know what you're doing. No, that's helpful, Cindy. And it's like you say, there's there's no concrete answers right there's now. No it's about being right creative now. and being doing the best we all can. Yeah. yeah, go back to your mission. Go back to what what's in your donors' hearts. What do they care about? And show I get I can't underscore this idea of authenticity uh, enough. Like it, this is human to human. We all need extra care right now. We all need to know that there's a, a human being on the other on the other line, so to speak. And so um, drop the like corporate speak and language and be casual and meaningful and authentic and caring. That's wonderful. Thank you, Cindy. So I think we're, we're on time. So we're going to um, stop questions there. Uh, Mel, would you like to uh, have any final words before we sign off today? Sure. Yeah, I just want to say um, a quick shout out to Cindy and her Flipside um, fundraising training program. We're super excited to provide a scholarship for that. You know, now is a time where we really need to just come together and support one another. And we just couldn't be happier to support the work that she's doing. Um, and then thanks again to you guys, you, Marina, uh, Robin, Cindy, for just putting on this webinar. We're really happy to be here today. So thank you. Well, thank you, Mel. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks, and we, Marina and the whole Trade Village team because, uh, well, and, and Tequila and Mel and their whole team. I really um, feel so strongly that um, we are in the presence of people who care and who are doing so much to support our communities right now. And um, that's definitely something we like being associated with. And we can't echo that enough, um, you know, and for, for all of the organizations, too, that we're seeing that are offering, you know, like Imagine Canada offering Grant Connect. And I, I should clarify, I think on their website, they do say they're offering it until April 8th at this point. Uh, so definitely get on there, like, right away and uh, check that out. Um, I want to thank Cindy so much for coming back and giving us a great presentation today. We 
We appreciate you taking that time. Uh, Mel and the team at Kila, thank you as well for co-presenting um, and uh, for the services that you're offering also. Um, just as a reminder, uh, we will follow up with you by email this afternoon. So you'll get the webinar recording and the full slide deck. So all of the links that Cindy had in her slide deck will be there. Um, there will be a short survey uh, that, that takes less than five minutes to fill out. I hope that you'll complete that for us. You can let us know if there's other topics you'd like to see us cover in the future. And we'll also be sure to share that feedback with Cindy. So any comments for her, you can leave there also. On behalf of Charity Village, uh, I want to thank you all so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you choosing to spend some of your time with us today, knowing uh, that, that everyone's in a terribly difficult situation right now. On behalf of Charity Village, Cindy uh, and the Good Partnership, and Melissa and Keila, we want to obviously also extend our gratitude for the hard work that you and your staff and your volunteers are doing during this difficult time. Uh, thank you again for participating in today's webinar. Uh, we hope that you have a good rest of your day and that we'll see you at a future session again. Thank you all. Take care. Bye.